Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his unfinished work, The Passes, Blaise Pascal is going to very consistently draw a distinction between two different conceptions, or if you like, two different fundamental comportments towards God, that is the divine. And he, of course, is, by the time he writes this, a practicing Christian. So it is the traditional God of monotheism that he has in mind. What is the distinction? It's between the God that is understood by the philosophers and not the atheists or skeptic philosophers. There's plenty of them out there, but, but uh, philosophers that actually do think that God exists and that we can have some rational knowledge of God. And then the God of the faithful, practicing, religious person who could be Christian, although at, at one point he says that uh, you know, genuine Judaism and Christianity are going to overlap to some extent. So there's some prospect for that there. We don't need to go into that at this point. The fundamental contradiction is between, we could say, the God of faith and the God of philosophy. Notice I don't say the God of faith and the God of reason because reason is not something that is solely on the side of philosophy as against religion or theology or faith, whatever it is that you set up as its other, Pascal is not Tertullian. He is not merely what we call a fideist who says that reason is useless and that faith supplies everything. Instead, his position is a bit more complex. Let's begin in thinking about this by looking at what he says about Descartes, because I think this is quite helpful for putting things into context. Descartes is one of Pascal's contemporaries, and he says, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he would have been quite willing to dispense with God, to not have God in the picture at all. But he had to make him, that is God, give a Philip, a, a little push to set the world in motion. Beyond this, he has no further need of God. And I think that that's, you know, a little bit of a uh, oversimplification of, of the Cartesian doctrine. But on, on the large, it's really a fair accusation that God shows up in the Cartesian system early on basically to give him a way out of the methodological doubt that he uses to get everything started and to provide a way to get all of the world of extension, which is what Descartes is really, really interested in as a scientist, out there and to allow a connection between the world of thought and the world of extension that can be certain or at least probable. After that, Descartes really doesn't use God or even refer much to God. He certainly, if he does have religious beliefs, is much more of a deist than a traditional Christian. So this is a good example of what Pascal has in mind. When he looks at the God of the philosophers, and again, remember, these are not all philosophers. This is a particular set in his own time, and we can find similar people today. They view God as this being that can be known, putting faith aside, putting religious commitments or revelations aside, can be known through reason. And this provides them with a great optimism. 
about our human nature and its perfectibility, about the capacity that we have to purify religion if we want to have it around, of any of its dross, superstition, silliness, any of those sorts of things. So um, what sort of forms is this going to take? Um, in part, what Pascal will call metaphysical proofs of God's existence. <clears throat> These are the things that are familiar to any of us by going and taking a philosophy of religion class or even an intro class or reading online about the, the area of philosophy of religion, the ontological, the cosmological, the design, we can go on and on with various arguments. These are all attempts to say that we have some rational grounds for asserting with certainty that the divine or God exists. And Pascal is going to say uh, a few things about this at various points. Um, the other key thing is what we might call the entire field of ethics. Philosophy can put God aside and put any sort of religious teachings aside and say, can we in fact come to understand what is best for us solely by looking at our human nature or looking at the way the universe seems to be designed or how it works for other animals or any of those sorts of things. Um, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Now, if we talk about the God of faith, what we will often call the God of of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is revealed through these Hebrew scriptures and practices, and then later for Christians like Pascal, revealed also through the figure, the person of Jesus and the things that are written about him, and then this ongoing activity of the church this is a God who is believed in. He, Pascal will actually draw a distinction between the philosopher who says, I know, skire, right, uh, skio and, in Latin, and the believer who says, I believe, credo, right? We get the word creed from that. So believed in by faith. And faith resides, it's not simply a blind adherence or some sort of emotional attachment, but it resides in what Pascal calls the heart. And it's, it's worth remembering at this point that Pascal has that very important discussion where he says the heart has its reasons that reason itself does not know. The heart is not merely some sort of lower emotional animal brain or something along those lines by comparison to our much higher cognitive faculties. The heart is actually the core of the human being as a fully human being. So it's also something that has its own dignity, you might say. How does faith get in the heart? This also is a place where Pascal is going to clarify God puts it in there. It's not something that you can will or wish your way into or take a pill and then suddenly you've got it. It's not something purely random. It happens through grace. So here we go beyond the realm of philosophy as such, of course, although philosophy can indeed extend itself to that point. It's not simply irrational. This is why I say that Pascal is not uh, merely a traditional fideist. In one of the uh, discussions, he says, the conduct of God who disposes all things well or kindly is to put religion into two places, into the mind by reason, which means that rational means could in fact help to lead to religion. But then he also says into the heart by grace. And he goes on a little bit further. This should, this is a good passage to think about. To will, to put it into the mind and heart by force and threats is not to put religion there, but rather terror. A big problem in Pascal's own time. And he condemned the attempts to try to impose religion upon people simply by force. He thought that was a counterproductive strategy. 
So what else can we say about this? Let's go back to the, the proofs of God's existence. Um, Pascal is actually going to tell us that, as he says, the metaphysical proofs of God's existence are not particularly convincing. Why is that so? They're, they certainly are convincing for those who accept the rational principles that those proofs are based on. Here's the passage. He says, the metaphysical proofs of God are so remote from the reasoning of men, so remote from most ordinary people's reasoning, and so complicated that they make little impression. And if they should be of service to some, he's not denying that they are useful for some people, it would only be during the moment that they see such demonstration. But an hour afterwards, they fear they have been mistaken. And this is, in fact, the experience of so many people who encounter arguments or proofs or whatever you want to call them, rational demonstrations of God's existence. They wrap their head around it for a certain amount of time. They say, aha, I do see that. That, that really does work. And then a little bit later, they're like, how did that go again? Now, why was I saying that it was a good argument? Um, Anselm himself, the originator of what has come to be called the ontological argument, himself wavered back and forth on whether the argument that he was seeking was actually a way of illuminating his mind or a tool of the devil for seducing him away from his proper job. So arguments for God's existence, you can in fact produce them, but they don't really convince people that long. There's another great passage where um, Pascal is talking about making arguments from the order that we see in, in things, in, in the world. And he tells us that... Um, many of these arguments are not all that convincing either. Here we go. He says, I admire the boldness with which people undertake to speak of God. In addressing the argument to infidels, that is people who don't believe or believe the wrong things, their first chapter is to, to prove divinity from the works of nature. And, and Pascal says, I wouldn't be astonished at their enterprise if they were addressing their argument to the faithful, for it's certain that those who have the, notice, living faith in their heart, see all at once that existence is none other than the work of the God whom they adore. They have no problem making that connection and seeing that it provides a certain intelligibility. But those in whom this light is extinguished and in whom we purpose to rekindle it, persons destitute of faith and grace, seeking with all their light whatever they see in nature, can, that can bring them to this knowledge, find only obscurity and darkness. To tell them that they only have only to look at the smallest things and they will see God openly, to give them as a complete proof of this great and important matter, the course of the moons and planets, is to give them ground for believing the proofs of our religion are very weak. So the philosopher thinks that they're accomplishing something with these proofs of God's existence. And the philosopher may in fact be accomplishing something for the philosopher. But the philosopher's proofs for really everybody else are quite weak. As a matter of fact, they only really work when you've already got faith working for you, in which case they're not exactly proofs, are they? They're at best sort of elaborations of the understanding. What about the issue of morality and happiness? Again, Pascal has a wonderful set of discussions about this. He says, all human beings seek, seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever means they employ, they all tend to this end. This is the cause for them going to war, others avoiding it and so on and so forth. He goes on a little bit further and says, yet after such a great number of years, no one without faith has reached the point to which all continually look. A trial so long, so continuous, so uniform should certainly convince us of our inability to reach the good by our own efforts. But example teaches us little. Thus, while the present never satisfies us, experience dupes us from misfortune to misfortune, leads us to death, their eternal 
crown. And what is he complaining about here? The philosophers think the way to happiness is a much more straightforward, easy to illuminate path than is actually the case. And that's a problem. Once again, the philosophers, um, you know, may in fact make it easy for themselves in pursuing God. But the God that they have in mind is a little bit different than the God of faith. And this is not going to be helpful for most people. Another area, uh, another passage, he says, they believe God alone is worthy to be loved and admired, and they've desired to be loved and admired of men and don't know their own corruption. And this is really one of the problems. The philosophers have too great a faith, and I am using that word deliberately here, in the capacities of their own reason. And because of that, Pascal thinks, they wind up being sort of, inhabited, you might say, by a kind of pride. A pride which is going to lead them astray. So he goes on and he, and he says, this is in another place, the God of Christians is a God who makes the soul feel that God is her only good, that her only rest is in him, her only delight is in loving him, who makes her at the same time abhor the obstacles which keep her back and prevent her from loving God with all her strength. What are those obstacles? He names them here. Two of them, self-love and lust. These are unbearable to her, whereas they may not be to the philosopher. The philosopher thinks that you don't have to really change yourself in order to understand God, in order to relate yourself to the divine. And a little bit later on, he's going to tell us, we know God only by Jesus Christ. So that's a very strong statement of faith. Without this mediator, all communion with God is taken away. So he says, all those who have claimed to know God and to prove him without Jesus Christ have only weak proofs. And so what is Christ showing us? What is the upshot of that for Pascal? Somebody might say, all right, so you Christians, what do you actually bring to the table? What is the distinctive value added, to use another term. Um, well, he tells us in, in several places what that is. He says, the Christian religion teaches people two truths. Well, these two truths, not exclusively these two truths. There is a God who people, human beings, can know, and there is a corruption within our nature which renders us unworthy of that God. And he says, it's equally important to know both of these two points. This is where the philosophers have gone wrong. They understood the one point that we can, in fact, come to understand God. They were far too optimistic in their own capacities to do so because they didn't take account of the corruption of human nature. He says, it's equally dangerous for man to know God without knowing his own wretchedness. It's also bad to know your own wretchedness without knowing the Redeemer who can free you from it. And he says, knowledge of only one of these points gives rise either to the pride of the philosophers who have known God and not their own wretchedness or to the despair of atheists who know their own wretchedness, but not the Redeemer. So he says, it's necessary to the human beings to know these two points. It's also merciful of God to have made us know them. And this is what the Christian religion does. So you might think about the faith that, that Pascal is putting forward as something different than the pure rationality of the philosophers as something that doesn't just simply go against rationality. It's not irrational. In some respect, it is super rational because it integrates the rational person and their faculty of reason into a fuller perspective that is going to be not simply in the mind, but also in the heart. This results in a different conception, a fuller, richer conception from Pascal's point of view of God than that which the philosophers can provide.